But by 2010, I decided to go public with my findings. And so I accepted fully that there's a creative force behind everything. And everything I did was training for what I'm doing now. All the things that used to be important to me really aren't anymore. Yeah, yeah. My whole value system has changed. I found that I was drawing towards myself magnetically information. Oh. And I find that when you get on the path to truth, yeah. if you're aligning yourself with right action under natural law, yeah. you do draw these experiences it's in. Fine. Okay, welcome to the Drake Michigan podcast. I'm very excited. Um, when I made a list, I had a wish list, me, Mark, when uh, when I first got going on this project with Kev. A uh, number of names at the top. I had Santos Bonacci at the top there and I had Mark Devlin right underneath. So I was very excited with the opportunity to, to bring you in. Um, obviously, when I had the pub um, back in the, the crazy period, um, you came and did a talk. Uh, which excite was very exciting for me. Um, so welcome, and also we've just had a festival, and you you did a talk there. So it's been it's it's been great for me because I've I've spent probably through through meeting you, I bought a couple of your books, and because I'm so busy a lot of time, I used Audible, and uh, and I, I managed yeah. to get one and three in, and I need to read number two yet. But in terms of the knowledge and the research that you have done, it's unbelievable. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming. No worries. Um, let, tell me how how did you first of all your passions obviously like me music. Mm. Um, how did you fall into the the kind of knowledge of knowing that it's actually being used in a in a different way to change society? How, what what was the catalyst there for you? It all started around about 2007, 2008, that sort of time period. Yeah. And by that point, I'd read many of the books of David Icke. Yes. Uh, my dad actually put me onto him because right. my dad is a bit of a prodigious reader. Fantastic. And by that point, he'd been through Eric von Daniken, uh, Zechariah Sitchin, and he'd got onto David Icke. Right. And he recommended that I read his books. And at that point... My impression of David Icke was probably the same as most other people in the UK. Yeah, the perception. Which is that he's a nutter. Yeah, yeah. That poor man's lost his mind, you know. Yeah, that's right. But my dad said, just read the books, give them a chance, yeah. and see if they resonate with you. Yeah. So yeah. I did, and I found that they answered so many of the questions that I'd had really? up to that point. Right. So I'd already started questioning why the world is so unjust. Yeah, why there was war everywhere, famine, injustice, poverty. Yeah. And those books made me realise that all that stuff is by design. It's not mm. accident. It's not human nature. Yeah. It made me realise that there is a shadowy so-called elite. Okay, yeah. Uh, a secret society network yeah. sitting atop every aspect of human society. Yeah. And uh, so that put me on a new path of research yeah. when I came to that realisation. Yes. And one of the things that I really wanted to get a handle on is how that played out in the music business. Okay. Because up to that point, I'd been a DJ for uh, over 20 years. Yeah, yeah. I'd done radio shows. Uh, I was fairly successful as a club DJ. Yeah, yeah. Playing R&B, hip-hop, urban music. Right. So I DJed all over the UK and I'd done about 40-odd overseas countries. Okay. But I grudgingly started to realise <laughs> that many of the artists that I was into yes. and many of the music genres that I was pushing were promoting certain agendas, right. which went against everyone's best interests. So uh, I also got put on at that time to a resource called Vigilant Citizen, vigilantcitizen.com. Yeah. Great website, yeah. still running. Yeah. It's a guy in Canada uh, right. puts that one out. And he specialises in breaking down occult symbolism. Interesting. As it appears in music videos and uh, ads and live music events, Hollywood movies, TV shows, all this stuff. Yeah. So that website made me realise that the music industry is absolutely corrupt. 
Wow. It's run by dark occultists. Yeah. What we might call Satanists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're psychopaths. They work in conjunction with military-grade social engineers yeah. to change societal attitudes towards certain things and to shape and mould the public psyche. Mm -hmm. And I realised that music was being used to achieve this. Yeah, yeah. And one of the genres that was most guilty of it by that point was rap and hip-hop. Really? Which I was very much into. That's the stuff I used to play. Yeah. And I came to realise that so many of the artists who I'd been promoting were being used to exploit these agendas. How did that make you feel? Very uncomfortable. Yeah. And there was a conflict of interests. Of course, yeah. Because at that point, I was still earning my living as a DJ. Yeah. And I didn't know what else I could do in life. I didn't particularly want to do anything else. Yeah. But uh, I felt my conscience was sort of prodding me in the ribs and saying, you shouldn't be pushing this stuff yeah. now that you know what it's being used to achieve. So I went through a few years of very awkward sort of cognitive dissonance. Right, okay. But by 2010, I decided to go public with my findings, with what I'd come to comprehend okay. about the true nature of the industry. So uh, from 2010, I started doing videos and podcasts yeah. and using platforms like Facebook and MySpace at the time. MySpace, was still yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Facebook. And uh, just stuck my head above the parapet. I thought, you know, F the consequences. This has just got to be done. And how did people take to that? Did you did you already have a following because of your obviously you were a successful DJ, so you already had a following. And how did people respond to these these new? Because it is it's difficult cognitive dissonance, isn't it? It's like yeah. oh, especially when it comes to a hero in the in the uh, celebrity mold, if you like. Because I know myself with my love and passion for music, it's it was obvious in the past few years that these people are just not what they you know all the lyrics that they wrote for example rage with the machine as i like to call them now you know comply as an album with I the love. Machine. Yeah, yeah comply you know and then it's like well it means nothing now to me that mm. the, the craft is great but it, the actual words mean nothing and it's empty so what was the response like to you i lost about 95% of my wow. DJ friends. Really? So there were lots of people that I used to uh, count as friends that yeah. I used to uh, encounter in the business. Yeah. And uh, when I think now about how many of those people I'm still in touch with, yeah, uh, yeah, I've lost about 95% of them. But it doesn't matter yeah. because when I set myself on that path, I gained so many friends, so many great contacts. Yeah. I've now got literally thousands of of friends all around the world Fantastic. as a result of the work that I've been doing for the past, well, what is it? 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've got no regrets at all about those that I've lost along the way. Yeah. There are a couple of people, a couple of old DJ friends who have come to me in recent years have they? and they've said, we can see it now. You were right. <laughs> it's funny. How Which is, happens, it's, it? it's very big of them to, to come to me it, and it, say that. Yeah. It's good that they uh, did But that, at the yeah. start, most of my old DJ contacts and my industry uh, people that I knew were mocking me and they were saying, you've lost your mind. All the things I used to think about David Icke, people yep. were thinking about me. Yep. I've lost my mind. I've gone crazy. I'm rambling incoherently. Mm -hmm. But here we are. It's 2023. It's a different world to 2010. Ooh, it's very different. Very different. Mm -hmm. It's so utterly obvious now. The agenda is so clear, is so blatant. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be more blatant no, no. if it bashed you violently around the head with a baseball bat studded with nails while screaming <laughs> through a bullhorn, I am an agenda, I am an agenda. <laughs> exactly. Wake up, you ignorant mother. Do you not think it's almost like they're trying to wake people up in a way yeah, as well? Yeah, I, I really it's like, think it's that, that obvious sometimes. It's like, yeah. how can you not? see it i but, really do yeah. i really do i was thinking about that this morning yeah. because they're starting to ramp up the con yeah, yeah. nonsense again <laughs> unbelievably you know it's the middle of summer yeah but they're still claiming that oh it's on the rise again and there's a new variant the arsehole variant whatever it's called <laughs> and uh, i just think back to some of the stuff that we've been told yeah. a few months ago we were told that they were testing sewage samples 
I saw that. Going into sewers mm -hmm. and sifting through what's there I saw that, to yeah. try and identify variants <laughs> of the v <laughs> And I think that's a coded way of telling us it's all a load of shit. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think and yet, still, yeah, people can't right. see it. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. I like it. It's going to be a real acid test if they do ramp this agenda up again mm -hmm. and really try to reintroduce masks and distancing and shutting down businesses yeah. and all the rest of it. If people go for that and accept it and have learned absolutely nothing from the last three and a half years. They are going to deserve everything they get. It's not a lot you can do, though, is there? We've, it's not like, like you say, everything's in the face anyway, and it's not like people that are aware of, of what's going on haven't tried desperately to, to, to do that anyway. We've but done everything we can. I think, I think I feel that a lot of people are not meant to wake up in this time for whatever the reason that is. I don't know. I just feel that some souls are just not meant to. Yeah. Um, and the souls that are... I've got, a, it's almost like there's a, a mission. I often feel that a lot of people feel that they've got their own personal mission. Yeah. Uh, at this point, there's a, there's a spiritual knew? war going on. Who knew years ago that <laughs> we would be in spiritual warfare no. at this point in our lives? No, it's if you'd suggested that to me 20 years ago, oh, yeah. I'd have told you to put the crack pipe down. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. But, you know, for some reason, <laughs> there's many of us now yourself, myself, and so many other people yeah. that are on this path. And we're fighting a spiritual battle. Definitely. We're fighting on the side of good and light. We're Absolutely. opposing evil and darkness. Yes. And we never would have imagined that our lives would come to this. And it's an interesting thing, because I, I always look back on my life. Before I had, I had a spiritual awakening around 2012, and my life changed considerably from then. Um <laughs> and, and that's when I started going down the route of corruption and everything else, and, th and almost things started just to come to me. Not not in a not in a, a download sense, but I was then coming across kind of um, I don't know. I'd find a YouTube thing about nine eleven, for example, or the, the the Boston bombings or something like that, and I'd be going, "Well, something's not quite right." Whereas before, I completely believed it. Um, so I can see my split. W was there a point in your life? leading up to where you went to this website and started to learn more about the industry itself was there a was there a a, a moment in your life where you went something's not right about this world yeah i think there were little clues along the way yeah that my life would converge to where it now is really so a very early memory that i've got is well the very earliest is when i was about 4 years old yeah. And I used to look at myself in the mirror and think, this is a mistake. I shouldn't be here. Really? Yeah. What am I doing here? Wow. I just used to look at that little boy looking back at me in the mirror. No way. Thinking, this is wrong. Interesting. Uh, and I was never supposed to be here. Yeah. Because my parents were told by doctors that they couldn't have kids. And so right. they'd resolve themselves to the idea that they would never have a child. Right, okay. And then along I pop. I don't know why I bothered. Because <laughs> you got a mission. But apparently I did. So I wasn't supposed to be here. So I remember oh. thinking that when I look back at myself in the mirror. And then when I was very young, I realised that it was wrong for there to be a royal family. I've always felt that. Yeah. I've always felt that. I always felt it was supremely unjust yeah. that one family had all that wealth and yeah, privilege. I've always been like that. Over and above all others. Yeah. And I thought, what is it about these people? Why are they so special? I was yes. probably about eight or nine at that point. Yeah, I think I was younger and I was at the same feelings. I was like, well, why? Why Why is these people yeah. supposedly better than us? Why do we have to listen to these people? I could never yeah. get my head around that. Yeah. I can remember a Queen's Silver Jubilee party, street yeah. party, yeah. in my road in 1977. Yeah. Uh, when all the families came out and brought tables out and, yeah. and brought food and drink and stuff. Yeah. And everyone was celebrating the Jubilee. And I was just thinking, why? What is there to celebrate? <laughs> and then uh, when I was 19 going on 20, this was early 1990. Yeah. 
I had, I suppose you'd say, a bit of a spiritual awakening then. Right. Because I started to feel different about myself, about the world. Yeah. It's as if there was some sort of shift. Okay. Some sort of consciousness shift, and I was tapping into it. Right. Interestingly, that's around the time that David Icke says that he got his truth vibrations. That's right. Yeah, it was that time. So right around that time, I was picking up on something. Yeah. But I didn't know what it was, and I didn't know what to do with it. So at the time, I had an aunt who was a Christian. Yeah. And she interpreted it as a calling from the Lord. Oh, all right. So she said, um, oh, this is your uh, calling. You've got to come and join the church. So I responded to that because I thought that's what it was. Sure. And I believed that I'd become a born-again Christian. Right. So I attended an evangelical Christian church for four years. Okay. By the end of that process, I'd grown very disillusioned with the whole institution yeah didn't like what i'd seen i saw some hypocrisy in the behaviors of some of the people in the church yeah and uh it just seemed phony and fake to me that yeah. organized religion with all the dogma yeah and all the rules and regulations so i left the church in 1994 okay but prior to that in 93 i'd gone on a christian retreat to the holy land oh wow. israel Wow. Or Palestine. Palestine, yeah. yeah. And uh, I got baptised in the River Jordan. Wow. Because that was part of my belief system at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And although I've turned my back on all the sort of dogma and all the uh, all the loaded stuff that comes with sure. Christianity, mm-hmm. I like to think that that ritual had some sort of beneficial effect. I think it was supposed have. to be washing away sins and yeah, yeah. A, a new sort of rebirth. And, and the water's a conductor as well. There's a connection with it all, I think. It's right. So very powerful stuff. And the, obviously the ritual itself is going to, it's full of love, isn't it? Yeah, it's full of good intent. Yeah, the intention's important. I think a lot of people in the Christian church, in, in that institution, yeah. uh, have been misled uh, are not being told the whole truth. But their intention is good. Yes. They're there to try and help others Definitely. and do the right thing. There's no malevolent intent there. Yeah, I think there's most people, I think most people are generally good people, yeah. most people. Yeah. But we do get distracted or, like I say, misguided. Um, and I think when it comes to, as we know, corruption, greed, greed is a big problem in this world, isn't it? And, and, and I th- I th- you know, institutions, like you say, in terms of Christianity or any religion for that matter, there's a lot of greed involved. There's a lot of wealth involved, isn't there? That's right. You know, and and the people who who attend in church on a Sunday morning are not the ones that are, you know, making those 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 decisions, if you like, and those uh, I yeah. don't know. They're just dragging people in, isn't they, in a way, really, and they're moving them in. It's 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 the sheep mentality again because we we are humans. We are herd animals, really. We we're, we're trying our best to think outside the, but also highly corruptible, sadly. We are, yeah, of course we are. It's a challenge. Bribable, yeah, bribable which is a massive problem. Look yeah. at look at it again. We don't, I don't want to speak too much about the past three years, but it's very obvious that people are easily bought. The That's souls it. are bought yeah. easily. Yeah, we've seen that. For nothing, though. It's my job. This is my job. I'm just doing my job. That's right. You know, and that, I, I, I like me personally, I found that really difficult because, like yourself, standing up for your because your soul is basically saying, no, 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 you, you shouldn't be doing this. And that was what we did at the pub. It was like, I'm just not doing it. And we lost everything. And I was happy to do that, you know. Mm. And I wouldn't have done it any other way, even looking back now when we're X amount thousands in debt and we lost our home and blah, 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 blah. I'd have, I'd have gone more hardcore now, looking back, rather than being as soft as I was from the start. Yeah. You know, well, because there's a job to do. Life is for learning. Life is for learning. And I often think if back in 1990 I'd interpreted that shift in consciousness yeah. in a different way, I might have embarked on the path to doing what I'm doing now even earlier. Even earlier. But it took another 20 years, almost 20 years beyond that. But I think it all happened for a reason. Yeah. So I went through many different processes. After I left the church in 1994, I became an atheist. I was quite a bitter quite a split, atheist. Right, okay. Yeah, because because of everything that I'd seen within the church institution, which mm-hmm. I didn't like, mm-hmm. it led me to think, well, there is no 
spirituality. There is no creator. Right. Which is a ridiculous idea now. No, but... But, but it's one yeah. that I held at the time. Yeah. So I gravitated towards the work of Richard Dawkins. Okay. I can't believe it now. Yeah. But, you know, he's quite an ardent atheist. Yes, yes. And uh, I liked his material. So I was an atheist for probably about 13 years. Right. And then by 2007, 2008, which is when my dad got me to read the David Icke books, I was starting to come back around to the idea that there's more to this life. Yeah, that's good. And by the time I went public with my work in 2010, I was absolutely back on the path to spirituality. And so I accepted fully that there's a creative force behind everything. It's it's obvious. It's self-evident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I could ever have thought otherwise. But you needed to go on that path, didn't you? Yeah, I needed that. Mm. I needed everything that I went through. Yeah. So I mentioned in the talk that I did yesterday that I was absolutely desperate as a, as a radio DJ to try and get on BBC Radio That's 1. That's right, yeah. Or one extra. <laughs> and I used to send up my demo tapes every six months or so. Right. And I even turned up at the Radio HQ and offered to take the programme director out to lunch right. to explain to him why he needed me on his station. Of course, because you, you're ambitious. Yeah, those were the lengths I wanted to go to. Yeah. And I used to get so frustrated when they kept knocking me back. You know, they'd post mm. my tape back to me and say, no thanks. Mm. And it used to really wind me up because I, I felt I needed to be there. Yeah, of course. But now I can see, with the benefit of hindsight, that that was my greatest gift, not making it. On yeah, those stations. Hundred percent, because you, the you, it's almost like again. I, I think everything's divine. So you, you, even though you got that frustration, your path was never meant to be that. Your exactly. path is what you're on now, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And everything I did was training for what I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. So my first proper job, I've only had one day job. Yeah. A proper day job, which was in the early '90s, and it was working for a business magazine publisher. Right. And I became editor uh, of one of their trade publications. It was for the stationery and office supplies industry. Okay. So stationery trade news, office buyer. Yeah. And I became editor of office buyer at the age of 24. And I got quite a decent salary. Yeah. I was able to buy my first flat at the age of 24. Right. At the back of this job. Yeah. So it served me well. Yeah, yeah. And the main takeaway from it was that it taught me how to write. So I had a Great. really good background. Uh, group editor yeah. who was a very eccentric guy, very, very <laughs> odd guy, <laughs> also, yeah. but uh, supremely talented. He was a genius. Right. He looked like a rock star. Did he? Uh, because he had long flowing hair and uh, <laughs> he, he was actually a musician. Brilliant. He was really unconventional. Yeah. But he taught me how to write. And also because he was so unconventional, he also taught me it was okay to push the envelope a bit and be a bit That's good. daring. That's good. Step outside the usual parameters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that taught me how to write. And then I got my first uh, radio job. Yeah. I was working at a station called Fox FM in Oxford. And then I got my first show on Galaxy Radio in Bristol. Right. And that taught me how to do radio shows, how to present, how to interview artists. Yeah. So that was that training. And I was also a club DJ. So I was getting records from the record companies, promo companies. Yeah. And that, made me realise how the industry works and how artists are promoted. Yeah. And all of that has been very useful in preparing me for, for the now. work that I've been doing the past few years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because now I'm writing books, I'm doing live talks, I'm doing interviews such as this. Yes. And all of that had to be there first, the grounding period, the training period. It's the training. It's so yes. clear to me now. Yeah. But you, you don't know it at the time, though, do you? Because no, you're just no. living your life at the end of the day. That's exactly. what you're doing. You're just trying to get through. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and, and sometimes you, when you get a decent job, if you like, that in you or a decent salary, you think, well, that's success. Mm. I mean, but then success can change. Success can be all sorts of things, can't it? That's the thing. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's also, what define what success is. You know, at that time, it, it, that's important. But right now. Yeah. All the things that used to be important to me really aren't anymore. Yeah, yeah. My whole value system has changed. Yeah. I mean, I want to be financially comfortable to be able to take it, care of my family. But it frees you up if, if finances are important, aren't they? Unfortunately, we're in a well, world where we need them. We live in a reality where exactly. we need them. We need them. 
Uh, but I've never been someone that's interested in great wealth. No. Even when I was fast asleep, I never lusted towards having fast sports cars and yeah. mansions and yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. yachts. Yeah. That was just never me. I only ever wanted enough to get by on. It, it, it allows you, I was talking to Billy Watson about this on a podcast recently. You know, all he, he's, he's an artist and he's, you know, it's an, it's an art form that he just wants to bring out. Mm. And without just a bit of, of this monetary value, which whatever that is, that energy coming in, it, it, it doesn't allow him to be free to express himself and be the artist. You know, right. I think as an individual, you, you, you don't need much, do you? Really? You need time. No, you the money gives you time to be Mark Devlin and do the research and get your knowledge out there. That's right. That's and all it is. Provide for my family. Provide for your family, yeah. It's and it really feels now as if I'm to a large extent, stumbling around in the dark because hmm. I don't know where things are going to go for me. Really? I know that I can't go back to what I was doing before. Not that I would ever want to. Yeah, get But that. all those bridges are burnt. Yeah, Like I that. said to you, 95% of the people that I used to know in the music business, mm -hmm. I don't speak to anymore. Yeah. I've got no idea what they think of what I'm doing. I like to think that some of them are observing from the sidelines. I bet they are. And thinking, hmm, yeah, this guy's I bet got they a point are. here. People are frightened to speak out for mm. their own careers. Yeah. They, are. they stay back in the shadows. Mm -hmm. But I think many of them are looking at what the likes of you and I do. I think so. Those of us that go public. Yeah. And uh, finding it of great interest. I think so. And I think this planting those seeds is massively important. Um, the work you've done, though, Mark, is incredible. Um, if you, you know... I'll put it on record. If you've not read any of Mark's books, then then you really need to. And uh, we'll we'll make sure that all your details are in the description so they can buy your books because sure. the detail. And this is where I wanted to ask you as well. How did you go about doing that kind of level of research? Because there's it's so detailed in individuals such as, say. Jim Morrison. Now, obviously, you know, as you know, I'm a Doors fan and I'm a Pink Floyd fan and blah blah blah, and and Jim Morrison is the is the is probably the ideal um, person to talk about in the respect that he is a, a, an anti-establishment rock star, so called, but with a military uh, upbringing. And, yeah. and and even when you even when I look back now, I'm seven, I'm seventeen years of age. Jim Morrison's my idol, if you like. Uh, this this the the rock star I'd want to be. I just wanted to be Jim Morrison. And then you watch the Oliver Stone film, and he even he's even mentioned. I think he's even mentioned that he was a, 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 his dad was a. a it is mentioned in that movie. Yeah, it's yeah. mentioned. Yeah. yeah, but it never twigged to me that there would be any kind of link. It's almost then because it was mentioned and it made it seem like that he went against his father. Yeah, The movie said that he yeah. disowned his it's, father it's, that's as a right. result of what he did. And, and then he became this, 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 ex, this iconic rock god. Yeah, exactly. And this yeah. poet and this, that. Yeah. But it's not like that, which is, so how do you start research digging into that when you've only got sort of a level of uh, propaganda as it is on who this individual is? How do you find out more? Well, my first Musical Truth book, mm. which I self-published because no conventional publisher was ever going to touch it right. in early 2016, yeah. was the result of five years' worth of research. So yeah. by that point, I'd been researching the true nature of the music industry for five years. Yeah. And I can't remember how I got started in terms of what the first steps were. I just kind of ploughed myself into it. I find the, the the best way to start any job, any task, anything you want to achieve mm -hmm. is not sit there worrying about it. Uh, don't really draw up too many plans. Just start it. Yeah. Just plough into it. Yeah. So my latest book, which I've just completed writing. Yeah. I can remember uh, at the start of the process, I was thinking, oh, uh, what am I going to make happen in the first chapter? And how am I going to develop the narrative and then I just thought I'm just going to start writing and see what happens yeah, yeah. and that's the way it was with my first book I just plowed into it and I found that I was drawing towards myself magnetically information oh interesting so once I'd started people were starting to come across my radar they were either emailing me with information or I was meeting them at, at events 
and they were telling me stuff. Manifestation. Or I was picking up a book and I'd open it and there'd be some information on that page. I love it. Yeah. Or I'd be watching it. a documentary and there'd be a little nugget of information in there which I'd extract. And I find that when you get on the path to truth, yeah. if you're aligning yourself with right action under natural law, yeah. you do draw these experiences it's, in. It's vibration, isn't it? Yeah. It's all it Attraction. is. Attraction. Attraction, yeah. It's the law of attraction. Exactly. And that's how it works. It does work. Uh, and you find yourself supported. 100%. I believe that. Guided. Another thing which I've found more with my live talks than with my books, but I'm often up there on stage yeah. doing one of my presentations. Yeah. And it really feels as if I'm channeling information from somewhere fantastic so i find myself speaking in a certain way yeah and it feels as if i'm getting inspiration and help from somewhere else that's it, isn't it yeah that is, I, I must admit i'm not i'm not a, a speaker like yourself but what i do find that that happens a lot for me also i don't tend to know what i'm even going to talk about and a lot of the time i won't even plan it it just yeah it just kind of comes a lot of songwriters talk about that Indeed, they do. Talk about channeling from yeah. the muses. Absolutely. Bringing stuff in from somewhere. I think you, Jim Morrison probably made comments like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, do you think, or do you know even that, that some of these artists that are obviously used as pawns in this way of, of societal change, when they're channeling and writing lyrics, do you think they are potentially channeling um, a dark side? From a, from a darker side rather than a lighter side, not realising that that's what they're doing because there's a manipulation that's going on or are they used by the industry rather than their, 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 their gift, if that makes sense or whatever. If, if I'm trying to explain myself rightly. So if, uh, say, say a, a songwriter writes a beautiful song that people are going to love, but the industry takes them... Um, but because they've got a beautiful song, they then carried through and they've got a following. And then are, are they then channeling something else to help manipulate those masses? Yeah. Or are they just bad people from the start? I think there's grades and levels to it. Yeah. So you have people like Jim Morrison, again, great example. Yeah. From a military career family. Yeah. And it's quite obvious he was a lifetime actor. Yes. He was yes. allotted that role. They wanted him to be that poster child for that counterculture. Yes. Anti-war generation. Yeah. yeah. So he was the iconic rock god that was Certainly put out was. there at the front of the doors. I do feel that he was uh, a pawn. He was exploited. Yeah. I feel some sympathy towards him. Yeah. Okay. He fulfilled the role that was given to him. Uh, I personally feel that he didn't die in 1971, well, in a bathtub in Paris. Well, it's an interesting... I always said this because there was only... Pamela Curson apparently saw him. There was no... Um, no was autopsy. It? No autopsy. That's and right. Yeah, it was all a bit odd. Yeah, yeah. And then she, Pamela Curson died, I think, a year later, apparently, as well. Yeah, so. I think it was 1974 she yeah. died. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think it's quite possible that Jim Morrison was allowed to retire that public yes. persona yeah. because of the family that he came from. Yeah, yeah and sort of disappear into the shadows. But with many of the others, it will be different from artist to artist. Mm -hmm. So with many of the rap artists, they've talked about channeling stuff when they write their songs. Okay. But it's very dark. Yeah. So Eminem, for example, yeah. his music is obviously very dark. Yeah, yeah. Right from the start, he was talking about murder and mutilation right. and yeah. drug abuse and all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Murdering his baby mother. Uh, and getting his daughter to yeah, help him dump Kim, the body in a lake. Yeah, Kim, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. that's right. Yeah. And Dr. Dre, a lot of his stuff is very dark. Yeah. Jay-Z, some very dark stuff. So with those hip-hop artists, they seem to have been drawing in some very negative influences. Sure. And many of them have even spoken of channeling demons. Really? There's this demonic entity known as Rain Man, which Jay-Z has talked of bringing in. I've heard of that. Also Little Wayne and also Eminem. Yeah. And they've yeah. all talked about this Rain Man entity. Interesting. And it's cropped up in some of their songs. But if you take it back to the early 70s, you've got songwriters like Elton John, for example, mm -hmm. David Bowie. Mm -hmm. And they've talked of that process when they've put together their songs of drawing it in from somewhere. 
Interesting. A yeah. cover story that we get with David Bowie is that he liked to take newspapers and cut them up with scissors. That's right. Yeah. Cut words out of them. That's and then right. rearrange the words randomly. And then create and come up with lyrics yeah. that way. <laughs> Not sure if I buy that one. No, I don't think I do either. But uh, one point to make about a lot of these artists is they're obviously corrupted. Yes. They're obviously being exploited and being used and pushing agendas. Yeah. But it's still great music. I know. This is the problem we have. It is, yeah. We can know the truth about who Jim Morrison was. Yeah, yeah. And how The Doors was likely put together. But it's still great songs. I know. I like a lot of their music. Yeah, yeah. Pink Floyd, there's a lot of suspect elements to that band. I know, I remember coming across one of your podcasts earlier in 2020 and I was like, right. no. Dark Side of the Floyd. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the one, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a great podcast. It's a great podcast. Yeah, it's, it's unwelcome information. <laughs> it is. But the fact still remains mm. that the music is amazing. Um, um, incredible. The craft. It's the craft. And I think the two reasons for that are firstly that these bands get access to the very best studios, the very best producers, mm -hmm. the very best engineers. Yeah, yeah. They also get training at the very best schools, foundations, institutions, so they become master musicians. Yeah, yeah. Master singers, master producers, master rappers. And performers. And the thing is, that, like you said, a lot of these guys, like Pink Floyd, for example... They, they, they're educated, and Queen, from, they, they, they've gone through high education. They're posh they? boys. Yeah, they're posh boys, yeah. Genesis. Genesis, These yeah. groups, you know, they're all public school boys. That's right, yeah. 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 And and they're the ones that you, the, you look up to as the, the, the rebel almost, but the... That's quite a strange thing when you really yeah. think of it. Yeah. You know, these guys have been to public school, so Genesis were formed yeah. at Charterhouse School in <laughs> Godalming, Surrey. And their mentor was Jonathan King. No, was it? Since outed as a notorious no, paedophile. No. So what could possibly go wrong there? Yeah, exactly. But that's not a natural career path for posh boys. Not really, no. To you, become rock stars. Because you look at, like, say, for example, my strong era of music is the, is the 90s. So from the Stone Roses, who I still absolutely love and thank god ian brown was standing out during the period yeah um because it, it's the only guy i can look up to anymore i just wish he'd do interviews yeah 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 you know yeah, he, yeah, he, he yeah. comments on social media yeah and yeah. he puts it in his songs that's right yeah but he needs to do interviews van morrison needs to do interviews. van morrison as well yeah yeah they don't that's right I think they've got gatekeepers that block them very 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 lightly yeah. you know but it'd be, it'd be love i'd love to love to chew Ian Brown's ear and find out what, what really goes on. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? I've put out invitations to Van Morrison, yeah. Ian Brown, yeah. and Eric Clapton right. to do an interview with me. Yeah, and none of them come and back. It's, they've all been blocked. Have they? Right, yeah. okay. What I was going to say about the 90s, though, you had this uh, working class thing going on. The, where say Oasis, for example, the your Gallagher brothers that apparently I don't I don't know the full the true story, but the story is that the you know on the dole or the work you know the working class the you know that kind of thing, and then the, 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 the all of a sudden these massive rocks. There's stars. always a story. There's always there? a story, of course, and it's fascinating. But that that inspires the people like myself because you look at those then and you go, well, if they can do it. I can do it. And I look up, you start looking up to them and that's how the celebrity stardom works, isn't it? That's how you're drawn into it. That's right. I used to be that way with DJs. Yeah. I used to look at other DJs. Yeah. And they served as my inspiration. And uh, unfortunately, one of those inspirations for me was Tim Westwood. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah, yeah. has since, well, there's yeah, on, yeah. ongoing investigations that's right. into him. That. Yeah. But it's not looking good. Yeah. And I now completely disavow myself of any affiliation with him. Yeah. But, you know, back in the day, back in the 90s, he had credibility. Mm -hmm. He had an amazing rap show on Capital Radio. Yeah. And I looked at him and I saw a, a, a white guy, uh, another public school boy, as it turns out. Oh, okay. His dad was a bishop. Right. Okay. An Anglican bishop of Peterborough. Right. He went to a very exclusive public school in Norwich. Right. I didn't know this at the time. Yeah, yeah. But that's his background. And I saw a white guy who had become successful in a black music genre 
rap and hip hop. Yeah. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I must be able to. That's what All it. I've got to do is work hard and yeah. uh, craft my uh, DJing and get to know the music and do a bit of networking and stuff. And I had some moderate success, yeah. but nowhere near his level. Do you think people are chosen then? Early? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think personally that was his allotted role. Mm. I think it was always on the cards that he was going to be inserted into society mm -hmm. in some sort of influential, prominent role. Mm -hmm. And it was just decided that he was going to become the gatekeeper for the UK rap music scene. So it's like you mentioned in the speeches today, your, your Bonos and your Bob Geldofs of these worlds who, who are very prominent in the global kind of way. Um, you, they're always they're always there giving it the this and whatever, aren't they? And yeah. Just like impu massive influences through, especially Bob Geldof in the 80s with Live Aid and things like that. And then... Yeah. As, a, as in the public, you're just seeing this guy doing this incredible work for humanity. Yeah. But then there's just this other side. Well, I bought it, it at the time. Yeah, well, yeah. I can remember that Band-Aid record came out in yeah. 1984. Yeah. And uh, we were sitting there watching it on TV, me and my parents. Yeah. And they were saying, oh, who would have thought it? You know, he just looks like this scruffy ruffian, this <laughs> this this uh, drug abusing rock star. And it turns out he's got a big heart. He's a lovely guy just goes to show you can't tell by by appearances <laughs> because they bought the public image of him that was that's, being sold that's right yeah. as most people did it wasn't until years and years later that i discovered the true nature of bob geldof wow and i realized that this nice guy image saint bob was all a crafted construct paulie yates said that his yeah. partner yeah yeah who uh got into a relationship with michael hutchins that's right in excess yeah so she left bob for Michael Hutchins. That's right. Didn't go down too well with Bob. No. Didn't end too well for Michael. No, it didn't. Who turned up dead in a hotel room in Sydney yeah. on the 22nd of November, the Kennedy assassination date, yeah. in 1997. Yeah. And at the time, Paulie Yates commented publicly that Bob Geldof had something to do with Michael Hutchins's death. That's what she said. Wow. She said, it makes me sick. People think he's this wonderful guy, this saint, but he's the devil, or words to that effect. Wow. And Michael Hutchins' his parents had similar things to say yeah. about him. Yeah, yeah. Then in 2000, not too long afterwards, Paulie Yates turns up dead. That's right. Yeah. Of an overdose. That's right. And then a few years after that, the daughter, the daughter. that they had together, Peaches Geldof, yeah. turns up dead of an overdose. I know it's it's very dark, isn't it? It is dark. Yeah, it's it's very dark information. Mm. It doesn't do well to wallow in it for too long. To no, no, you you've got you can't do that because otherwise it lowers your vibration. That's but right. it, I think awareness is important as well as we navigate through these things. I think it's very that's why your work's so important because it brings awareness. But like you say, you can still enjoy the craft. So if you, even though we, it's like for example. Like say again, the doors, for example, you know that what they're really about now. Yeah. But you can still stick a record. It's not the same. I must admit, for me, it, it, it never feels the same anymore. I, I can't have that same feeling that I did. Yeah. But I can still enjoy it in a in a in a way. I just try and switch off a little bit. Yeah. And just go and sing along if I have to, or just you know. But I, it, it does I know change what you mean. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite the same. No. You can still get some enjoyment from it. You're yeah. just aware now of who these bands really were. That's right. And I'm finding that what you have to replace it with is truth and freedom music, authentic yeah. music. Yeah. It yeah. is out there. Oh, there's plenty. It's not the stuff you hear on the radio. It's not bands or musicians that people have heard of. They're not household names. No. no. Obviously, because they've not sold out. They won't out. be allowed to, but will they? <laughs> you had your event at the weekend, and there was some great music. Just as I was loading up my car with my books to leave... I was hearing the musician that was on yeah, and he was singing songs about what's going on in the world and that's truth right. and yeah. standing up for your rights and all this. And yeah. that's exactly the sort of stuff we should be listening to. And it is out there. If it you is. look for it, you can find it. If you're enjoying everything that we're doing here at Drake, Michigan, please subscribe, ring my bell and let's enjoy this journey together. But isn't it interesting though, because we can talk about that as well, because the Sex Pistols, they kind of, they were meant to, Give that, and they created a movement from the Sex Pistols, didn't they? I suppose in the, the punk side of thing, but again, that wasn't what what they were really about, were they? It was a construct. 
Yeah. Yeah, the whole punk scene was a construct. <laughs> it's all I remember bad. listening to a podcast series with Jan Irvin and Joe Atwill yeah. from years ago called Unspun. Yeah. And they sort of went genre by genre and just unpicked <laughs> these constructs. And they did a, a series of shows on punk and new wave. Right. And just showed how that whole thing was just a put up job. The Sex Pistols were a boy band, effectively. Yeah. They were patched together by Malcolm McLaren. That's right. To yeah. push certain agendas. Malcolm McLaren was a situationist. That's this highbrow intellectual sort of anarchist movement that came yeah. out of France. Yeah. A guy called Guy Debord. Oh, right. Okay. And a lot of rock musician managers yeah. were situationists. So they bought into all of that. Right. So Malcolm McLaren, yeah. manager of the Sex Pistols, Bernie Rhodes, yeah. manager of the Clash, right. was a situationist. No way. Also Tony Wilson. Was he? Of Factory Records, no, New Order. really? A situationist. No. So they were all part of this sort of intellectual movement. Yeah. Which could be construed as a mind control cult, I yeah. guess. And that was filtering down into the bands that they controlled. Wow. So when you've got those three high-profile managers yeah. sitting in those prominent positions controlling these bands, yeah. if you're going to be honest about it and mature about it, you have to accept that there are agendas being pushed there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you think, do you think the, the, the artists know what they're doing? A lot of them? Or all of them? Well, it's a good question. I think some of them will be clued in. Yeah. If you come from an important bloodline family mm, well that's and you've been given your yeah. role as a result of that, you'll be clued in. Yeah, definitely. I think Jim Morrison knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. I think Bono knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. There was a great video. I wish I could find it again. It was many years ago. Yeah. Bono meeting some African world leader. Right. Like a president of one of the African nations. Okay. And he walks into the room and hangs up his coat on the peg. Yeah. And he, he's sighing uh, and he's showing all the signs of just not wanting to be there. Right. It looks like he's totally reluctant to have to do this. And he's like, oh, oh. and then like, okay, let's get this over with. <laughs> and then he goes up to the guy and shakes his hand and does all the pleasantries and stuff. But yeah. it strongly suggests that he just doesn't want to be there. Right. But he's being forced Playing to do a it. role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many of them know what they're doing mm. and they probably do it reluctantly. But I'm sure many others are not fully clued in. Yeah. Particularly when it comes to a lot of these photographs that you see, the promotional photographs, where they're covering the one eye. I'm not actually going to do it because otherwise somebody out there... Oh, they'll just they'll is, take is a picture gonna, of it. They'll and freeze it'll frame the video they will. showing me doing it. Guaranteed. Saying, I that. told you he's a Satanist. Yeah, guaranteed. So I'm guaranteed. not going to do it. Yeah, don't do it. But they cover their eye. Do they it. do the pyramid symbol. Yeah. They do the 666 symbol. Yeah. And I'm sure the photographer is telling them to do it. He's yeah. Like, you know what would look really cool? Just, yeah. just put your just hand over, over your that. right eye. That's it. Yep, do that. And then put your fingers up like this, you know. And they do what they're told to do yeah but they don't have any real comprehension of what it means yeah so they're total pawns yeah. many of them yeah yeah sure so again sure. it comes to grades and levels yeah because people can wake up obviously during that like like say for example like, let's let's say ian brown for example so ian brown there are photographs of ian brown doing that. there are yeah but then as we know over the past few years ian has one of the very few to actually open, like I say, he doesn't do interviews, but on his tweets, they were very powerful and he took a lot of shit. Yep. And I, I'll give him massive credit his on that. His own fan base turned against him. The Storm Rose's fans turned against him. Yep. I saw that and he took a lot of hate. Yep. Uh, but he Van continued. Morrison, same way. Same way, yeah. Yeah. So I'll give those guys respect in that. Yeah. So there's photographs of Ian doing those symbols that mm. we've just discussed. Yeah. And... We have to give him the benefit of the doubt mm. in terms of most of those photos were from early in his career. That's right. And if he'd been instructed to do them... Yeah, exactly. It's possible he didn't know what they meant. Absolutely. And now that he does, yeah. he's looking back on it and regretting having done it. It'd be lovely to talk to him about it would. that kind of photo shoot, wouldn't it? 
Yeah. And 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 get an understanding of, of I, how, I what de- I dearly wish he would do interviews. Yeah, yeah. Somebody told me that they knew him. Yeah. And they said that they were talking to him about my book, but that they'd seen me mention in one of my videos the it, fact that early it, in his career it, it was me. I think was it the crown. Yeah, when you <laughs> yeah, it was me. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, and then he he, he he and then was, he said, oh, I was going to read Mark's book, but yeah, I'm not going to bother now. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's what he tweeted. I remember it. And I, I mentioned it to yourself. But, and I, you know, if, if on the off chance, if Ian is watching this video. We would love Or if that. anyone knows how to reach him. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to sit down with him. And talk. And have an open that. chat. Yeah, And be great. we can talk about all this stuff. Absolutely. I'd love to do but that. It'd be great knowledge to know anyway, wouldn't it? Of what, I'd, I'd love to know what the process is of why people are putting all their hands over their, thing, their yeah, eyes yeah. and stuff. Because most do it, don't they? Yeah, most of them. Most yeah. of them. Yeah. And, and and then the photographers themselves, if they are directing it, what? why? Well, they've got to know. The photographer that's telling you to do it yeah. has got to know what's going on. Yeah. It's just crazy. So a lot of these photographers are going to be high-level initiates. Mm. Stands for reason. Yeah. Like I said, l- levels, but layers as well. Everywhere, just just different layers of of, yeah. of of all this this satanic corruption. It's it's there's it's, compartmentalization as well. Yeah. So I've spoken to quite a few people that have worked in the music industry. I get so many emails now. I get emails from producers, audio engineers, record company executives, people that have just worked at every level in the industry. Yeah. And a lot of them say to me, "I've read your books." And I've looked at the sort of stuff you say. Yeah. And I worked in the industry for 25 years, and I can say I didn't see any of that. Right, okay. But just because you didn't see it... Doesn't mean it's not... Doesn't mean it doesn't go on. No, but you can see that in in a lot of ways of what's happened in the past few years. Just because an individual doesn't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. That's right. Because that's, again, cognitive dissonance anyway. And also, uh, what's that famous quote? Uh, A man's understanding of something depends directly or a man's salary depends directly on his understanding of something oh, i can't yeah. remember the exact quote yeah, yeah, but the yeah. implication is that if your salary and your job depends on you not understanding something yeah you're not going to understand it because yeah, you don't it, want to because you want to protect your salary and your pension and a lot of people will do that and i think a lot of people uh as well are just gonna go in and do their hours and come home as well and just do their their tasks they don't want to rock the boat no i mean in the last three years how many nurses and doctors Mm. do we think there are who know what's going on Mm. but they don't want to rock the boat they don't want to upset Mm. things it's going to be a lot they they go along to get along Mm. and they do what they need to do to feed their family, pay the mortgage. Yeah. There's probably an uncomfortable feeling within them while they're doing it, but they don't know how else they would pay their bills. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't like to be that person that no. has that because I don't know where that soul's going to go afterwards with what's exactly. going on. That's quite a, exactly. it's quite a tricky one, really. If you, if, if you, I've, as we touched on it before, if your soul is saying something, I think you should listen. That's right. That's your gut is really important. The real heroes of the past three years are those that have lost livelihoods mm. and businesses. 100%. 100%. As a result of doing what they know to be right. Definitely. I said it. With, uh, Matt Hoy sang for us on Saturday night at the festival. And my, my sort of, I announced Matt on and I was saying, look, there are many heroes, many heroes in this, this marquee at this Unsung point. Unsung heroes. Yeah. But if you're going to stand up and prepare to lose everything for the truth, for your truth, then you're a fucking hero. That's right. That's good karma. Yeah, I That's think so. That's good for the soul. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I've got goosebumps now. Yeah. You know, because that's true. That's so true. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're living proof of the fact that uh, money, income, business isn't everything. It's no. not what these lives are about. No, I, I agree with you. It's not. But we are in that world where we do need to navigate with with this energy, this 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 promissory note, and we do we do need to do that. But we can manifest that anyway. We don't need to. We don't need to do the wrong thing. We can yeah. still listen to our gut, and and yeah. then and then the, I I believe that we are guided and looked after. Yeah, that's totally. my that's my belief. You know, totally. and we lost everything. 
I was prepared to do that because I know, even though it made me poorly at the time, I know good things will come anyway. And it, it is doing. Yeah. It is You've got to have that trust, that faith. Yes. That things are going to work out if you're on your rightful path. Absolutely. And you know when you are. Yeah, you do. I know I'm doing what I came here to do now. Yeah. It took me a long time to realise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I meet so many others who will say the same thing. Yeah. They're on their rightful path. And you do get looked after. Yeah, you do. 100% you do. if you like, spiritually. I think so. And like I said, you burn all the bridges back to your old life. You couldn't go back if you wanted to. Not that I ever would want No, to. I'm the same. I couldn't. But you can I only couldn't. move forward. You can never go back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've got to surrender almost. I, mm. That's what I found. And it was interesting because when I when we lost the pub, and you, you met me then, right the very last weekend, really, we were closing the pub within days when you and you guys came and did that. One event. last party. One last party, and it was wonderful. But we... I'd made a decision to, to get myself a job because I needed to look after my family. That was, I've always been the, the provider. My partner's disabled. We've got kids, blah, blah, blah. And I got this job and within no time at all, I felt very poorly. I wasn't meant to do that job. And I didn't realise at the time how, you know, I, I full of anxiety. I was literally crying before I was going into work on a Monday morning or the Sunday nights was dreadful because the week ahead was full of fear. Um, and I had to surrender. I had to basically surrender to the universe and go, I can't do this job. So what's next? Because I, I, can't, else. Do, I can't do it. Yeah. And then Kev phoned me up out of the blue. I went on a bit of a self-healing journey and Kev phoned me up, my mate, for who we're doing the Drake Michigan project with, out of the blue um, in the summer. And we started going. And my, my family, we've ended up in social housing but it ended up being the best thing for us as well because it just released a lot of pressure. And now my life is building wonderfully. We're heading in the right direction because I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. And I know that and I can feel that. I mean, the weekend prove, proves it in a way. Financially, I think we, we it's not a success in any... But it, it's, again, defining success because the, the, I think financially we're probably at a loss but it didn't matter because the energy in and the, the lives hopefully that have been changed from it's a being a great weekend. There, I think I'm sure so. you'll get to do another one. I'm going to sleep first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do that. Yeah, sleep first. But yeah, I, I, I'm really pleased. And I'm like I said, we had some great speaking hosts. You were the first person on the list for me, Mark. I wanted you to be there. You know, so I'm really grateful. Happy to have been there. Yeah, grateful. Can I ask, I, before we even get to close this off, one of the first videos I found of yourself, one of the first, it was, was Paul McCartney. I've got to talk okay. about, a little bit about that, if you don't mind, because it's just a fascinating subject. And and I ended up, when I, during the crazy period, I did actually fall ill. I don't know what it was. It was I felt poisoned actually. There was I did too. Yeah. October twenty one, I got very ill. Yeah. And it was it was around that time, I think, for myself. But so I got I, I downloaded the Billy Shears from from listening your to your your lectures. I got I'll I'll download the Billy Shears book. Right. And I thought it was incredible. I loved it. And 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 it, and I became I became more of a funnily enough, I became more of a Beatles music fan from that. As well, interestingly, because from Sergeant Pepper's onwards, I just fell in love with the music. Mm. And from be before that, I have no, I have no interest. Bef mm. the, if, now, the Paul McCartney thing is obviously fascinating. Did you change your Did you change your path on on, on any shape on that? Because it was kind of fall was was and yeah. Billy Shears and everything else. So did because you, you, we can be taken down paths and we'll say it and then yeah yeah. There's nothing wrong with being that either, is there? Yeah. Uh, so I remember first hearing about the idea that Paul McCartney died yeah. in 1966. Yeah. Back in the 80s when yeah. I was at school. Yeah, yeah. Some kid at school was talking about the Abbey Road sleeve. And he was saying, oh, because he's barefoot on the zebra crossing, it that's, means he's dead. That's right. And yeah. at the time, I just remember thinking, well, that's ridiculous. That doesn't prove anything. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. And then years later... It came up in my research, the idea that that's not really Paul McCartney. So I threw myself down that rabbit hole, yeah. went about 500 miles down, <laughs> and just completely absorbed myself in the whole subject. 
Yeah. So in Musical Truth Volume 1, there's an entire chapter on the Paul is Dead conspiracy. Yeah. 15,000 words. Yeah. I've included all the clues that were on the albums and the yeah. sleeves and the photographs That's and right, interviews yeah. and stuff like that. And so early on, I bought into the idea that the original Paul McCartney died in 1966. Yeah. We're told September 11th. That's the most popular date for it. Yeah. 9-11-66. That's right. And uh, I looked at all the anomalies between the Paul of pre-66 yeah. and the one that we have now that yeah, we've had yeah. since. And I could see that it's just a different guy. Right. You know, height differences, facial differences, differences in mannerisms. So I was very invested in the idea that the guy today is an imposter, Billy Shears, William Shepard. Yeah. But then, by the time I published Musical Truth 2 in 2018, I had certain voices whispering in my ear saying, uh, it's not as simple as that. Oh, okay. Uh, if you look at photographs from before 1966, you will see the guy that we have today. Yeah. So, yeah. how does that work? So then I concluded that, yes, there have been two Paul McCartneys. Okay. It's definitely two different guys. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean the original guy died in 1966. Died. Yeah, yeah. Because these people that were speaking to me were saying, you see both Pauls all through the timeline. Interesting. Pre-66 and post-66, you see both of them. Interesting. Then I discovered the memoirs of Billy Shears yeah. through Mike Williams, Sage of Quay. And Mike has done an incredible, monumental amount of research into that whole idea right, okay. of Billy Shears yeah, yeah. taking on the role of Paul McCartney yeah. and all the occult elements to it, the ritualistic elements and stuff. And uh, one problem I always had was that there was one particular picture of Paul McCartney yeah. from, I think it was 1960. It was taken in Hamburg right. by Astrid Kirscher. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who was the girlfriend of Stuart Sutcliffe, yeah. the original bass player. That's right. She was a photographer and she did a photo shoot. And there's a very young McCartney and he looks a lot like the guy we've got today. Okay. A younger version of him. Right. And I approached Mike about this and I said, this is a, a problem that I've got because this guy wasn't supposed to have come on the scene until 66. And Mike said that photographs and footage on the internet now has been doctored uh, to make the original, uh, the, the Paul we have today, the imposter, uh, okay. appear as if he entered the timeline much earlier. Oh, wow. So Mike's contention is that you can't trust anything you see on the internet, anything in digital form. Because no. pictures, video footage, these recent films... The uh, Eight Days a Week film, the Peter yeah. Jackson Get Back films. Yeah. He and others say that that's propaganda yeah. to reinforce the idea that it's always been the original Paul. Right. So, Interesting. I don't know. I don't know if these photos have been doctored. Yeah. But I'm coming back around now. I seem to have gone full circle. Oh, really? I'm coming back around to the idea that there was a ritualistic sacrifice of the original Paul in 66 wow. and that this guy Billy Shears has been playing the role since one thing I can say with absolute certainty yeah. is there has been more than one Paul McCartney well there's different ear shapes and all sorts isn't yeah, there yeah. it's quite obvious it's not you need to look at photographs of him with Jane Asher his girlfriend in the 60s right right. because there's some photos where Paul you can see it's a different guy yeah the original Paul yeah is about the same height it's as Jane Asher. Face, isn't there, isn't yeah, it? rounder face. He's about the same height as Jane Asher. Yeah, yeah. And then after Billy came on the scene in 66, Good there's time. photographs of Paul and Jane, and Paul's towering above her, That's way taller. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you can see their feet. You can see he's not wearing stack heels. So that can't account for the height difference. And when you look at the photographs of Paul and Jane together, it becomes so obvious. Wow. Wow, it's mad, isn't it? But this is the thing. Nowadays, it's even worse, isn't it? Because AI and everything else, they can yeah. create anything. So well, the worst thing of all anything? is the realisation that they've got away with it. Yeah, They've yeah, been getting yeah, away yeah. with it for yeah. almost 60 years. And I know there's a lot of researchers, there's a lot of vigilant people, a lot of awake and aware types that know damn well yeah. that there's been more than one Paul McCartney. But in terms of mainstream normie land... There's no official recognition 
of the fact that he was replaced. So they've got away with that psyop. They get away with everything, don't they? They seem to do, yeah. They've got away with Convid. Mm. The, the biggest hoax, the biggest scam, the biggest psyop in the history of the human species. Yeah, they got away with it in a moment. They got away with it. Mm-hmm. And now it seems they're coming back for another go. <laughs> it's crazy times, Mark, for sure. It's... Um yeah, it's it's a spiritual war, like we're saying, bro. You've exactly. got to, this is where you've got to look within. I've always said you, we've got to look within, and we've got to trust that gut again. It's that it's just something's prodding you there, down there, and it's saying something's not quite right. Yeah. Have a listen, because this is what tricks us. This is what we is what tricks us. Our senses and everything else, the, the perceptions we have, we get tricked by them. Yeah, but something will be telling you something's not quite right. But they, the controllers, mm. have been unleashing military-grade psychological 100%. warfare on us. Yeah. So it's no wonder people have been tricked. Oh, God, yeah. Because yeah. they're unleashing an arsenal of weaponry. Definitely. It's nobody's Which is fault. as extreme as it gets. Like yeah. I said in the talk yesterday, they're employing master psychologists, yep. behavioural scientists, yep. social scientists who know exactly how the human psyche works and how to trick it and manipulate it. I don't know people sleep at night. Oh, exactly. How can you do a job like that and be okay with it and sleep at night? It's got to be demonic, hasn't it? How how can they do? I don't know. Well, they've got to be psychopaths. They've got to just, all of them have got to be psychopaths, sociopaths, because I don't think a regular person could do that. I don't don't actually think... (laughs) A true human being can harm another, unless it was in defence. I don't. That's I just don't think it's possible. Yeah, and most people, like you were saying earlier, I think they are inherently good. Yeah, they don't want to do harm to others. No, they want to help others if they can. Yeah, definitely, they've just been tricked. Yeah. So all those people that were masking up during, you know, the first lockdowns, and. Grassing up their neighbours. Yeah, but they think they're doing the right they, thing. They, they believe their neighbours were going out there spreading this deadly disease exactly. and harming yeah. others. Yeah, yeah. And obviously they were misguided. Obviously they were ignorant and, and hadn't done the research. But they themselves believed they were doing the right thing. 100%. And, and, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. That's what I say as well. You know, if you, if you, if you, if we own up to it. Just like... It's but fine. the excuses are getting thinner and thinner. Yeah. You know, the excuse that I didn't know, I didn't realise that this was a genocidal agenda. Mm. Really, is it possible to say that anymore? <laughs> with everything that we now know, with all the research that's been done, with all the brave broadcasters and speakers and authors that have stuck their head above the parapet, yeah. all the books that have been written in the last two or three years, yeah. all the documentary films, all the public talks and the demos and the rallies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can anyone really make the claim now that they didn't know this whole thing was a massive psyop? It's getting flimsier and flimsier. Well, it's more obvious, isn't it? The veil's been lifted, though. That's what I think. It's, uh... Anyone still ignorant has made the choice to be ignorant. At this stage in the game. I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, I'll go with that. They don't want to know. Everyone, look, everyone has heard someone say in the last three and a half years that what's been going on is not what you think it is. That's right. Whether it's somebody at work, that nutty uncle, <laughs> uh, that, that, that crazy neighbour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, everyone's heard it said. So they've had the opportunity to look into it, do the research, as we have. Yeah, exactly. And they've chosen not to do that. There are consequences for willful ignorance, spiritual consequences. There is. Consequences there is. for your soul. There is. And that's why we're here with free will. You choose. Right. But you can choose another path, though. Right. Ignorance is a choice. Yeah, yeah. So is yeah. knowledge. I've always said it that, you know, everyone is, is playing a part. Everyone. But the ignorant ones are the are, the, are almost the worst for it, really, because they're, yeah. they're, they, they've not chose a side to sit him, sit him out of it, keep him out of it. Yeah. And, and you, it's about balance, really. But 
When you get really high level spiritual uh, and take a really high consciousness perspective on things, mm -hmm. people will say that those who are remaining in ignorance are facilitating our soul journeys. Yeah. Because we need them as adversaries. We need them to present challenges yeah. for us to rise above. Yeah, yeah. And I get that. But the ultimate goal of these human experiences must be to live freely. I think so. It's freedom. Yeah, I agree. That's what we gravitate towards. Yeah. We want to be free. Yeah. We don't want to be enslaved. No, no. We so, didn't come for that. So the battle has to be winning freedom. Absolutely. Overcoming tyranny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here we are. And and it, it, there's two choices really, and it's love and fear. Yeah. And and the vibration is important, like you say, because when you in terms of manifestation, you were saying you're on your, on your path when you're on the right path, things come into your life. Yeah. The way the way they're meant to do. So if you make that choice, you, you'll find your life is going to improve. You might have difficult. You might you might have a clearance at first. That's yeah. what I find with things. You know, it's like yeah. you. You know, once you, you've made a, a decision, you might find friends will leave you or family You are going to go through some you. turmoil. You will go through your turmoil. Yeah. Everyone that I know, and I really only associate now with sort of awake and aware mm. truther types, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. To call them that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every single individual that I know yeah. has been through suffering and hardship Yeah, last two or three years. Yeah, yeah. And is going through it now. And people email me every day. Uh, you know, maybe their relationship has broken down, mm -hmm. long-term marriage mm -hmm. has ended, mm -hmm. their children don't talk to them anymore. Yeah. They've lost their jobs, their business. Uh, they've had illness. Yeah. Uh, mental illness. Uh, a family members committed suicide. Yeah. I'm hearing all these stories. So we're really, really being tested. Oh, definitely. And we're all going through some stuff. Yeah, definitely. Everybody's going through something. And it seems that's necessary. I think so. It's like it is like a clearance. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then and, and but that releases the shackles. I think sometimes as well. Even though that period's tough. Yeah. Once that period is over, because everything's temporary. Everything. Yeah. Then then you start opening up a bit. Then if you can come through it, get to the other side, mm -hmm. and look back on it, and say what a bloody nightmare that was. Yeah. But from it, I've learned this, this, and this. Exactly. Then that's growth. That's the growth. That's the journey. Yeah. And that's what we're here to do. But we, like you said, we're here to be free. It's terrible when you're going through it. Mm, it's hard work. And I wonder, you know, the, the stories people have. Yeah. The stories people tell me. Yeah. There was a lady at this conference in Nottingham that I was at at the weekend who was yeah. talking about her son was institutionalised in psychiatric wards right. for 29 years. I would. And they tortured him, gave him electroshock, solitary confinement, oh all word. of that. And then after 29 years, he died. And I was just thinking, how do you get, how do you get through that for her as a mother? Yeah, exactly. How do you ever recover from that? But people do. They find the strength somehow. Yeah, yeah well, the human spirit is incredible. Yeah. And I think this is where um, they've underestimated humanity. Yeah, yeah. You know, because whatever whatever these dark agendas are, whatever whatever you know side you are in terms of uh, uh, if you believe that there's a, a devil, a, sa a Satan that's ruling this planet, or whatever that is, because that's my feel anyway. But you know, whatever you think, you know, we, we the, the, the 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 fact is, love always conquers. Anyway, yeah, the light will always outshine, always. I think a strategic error that the psychopaths have made is that they like to lump all of us in together as useless eaters. Yeah, yeah. So they'll take the sort of people that attend your event yeah. and all the great events that I go to and lump us in with all the mask wearing sort of yeah. Coronation Street watching, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, normies, NPCs, whatever we want to call them. Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. just think we're all goyim, cattle, whatever, mm -hmm. they've underestimated the fact that many of us are able to rise above that yeah, and yeah. have. And that human spirit, when it's got a flame lit under it, yeah. is an incredible thing. It's powerful. 
And they've underestimated that. I think so. And that is what ultimately is going to be their downfall. No, I don't. I'm not claiming that's going to happen tomorrow, next week, or even in my lifetime. There, there are many times that I feel I'm not going to live to see it. Maybe my children won't live to see it. Yeah. Maybe it's 100 years off. Yeah, yeah. But at some point. I, that's, I, I've said the same thing. Me and my partner have said the same thing. We might not see it in our lifetime. But ultimately. We're sowing the seeds. We're, we're part of that. Yeah, we have to play our part. Yeah. And it's about tipping the balance and educating. What yeah. gives me goosebumps is imagining a situation a hundred years from now yeah, where the demonic control system that we've currently got has been put down yeah, and humanity has attained some semblance of collective freedom. Yeah. And people are looking back at these times. They're going, what must it have been like I know, to yeah. live in the 2020s? What must those people have gone through? Uh, and they're looking <laughs> yeah, at right. they're looking at the books, the documentary films, yeah, all the the evidence that's been left behind of what life was like in the early twenty twenties and what we all went through. And they're devouring it, reading those books, reading those words, and thinking, "Wow, those people went through that." Really gives me goosebumps. To Do you know what that. this is, what you're saying there is so important as well? Because I was thinking in, t- in terms of the way the digital shit that's going on at the moment and the fact that they can manipulate digital stuff so easily. Oh, yeah. People need to write. They need to document stuff and they need to keep hold of it. We need paper books, mate. We do. Because everything that's on the internet right now yeah. could be gone in a heartbeat forever. Absolutely. There, need, there needs to be a way of documenting the whole thing yeah. because they will, as they have done, they will change history oh, yeah. Yeah. again. Yeah. That's why we need physical books, yeah. actual books. Yeah, yeah. Keep paper books alive. Definitely. And everyone needs to read, read more. Well, this is the thing. It's like this digital prison, this digital world, it's, it's, it, we're missing that tangible product, aren't we, that... It's like again, and you know, not not to go into it, but but the albums for themselves, you know, the fact that where the way society's gone now, you know, Spotify and just listening to the yeah. old track here and there, the throwaway society, when there was nothing more pleasurable for me as getting a, a vinyl album and listening to it from from the beginning to the end yeah. and li- what, reading the lyrics and with all with a the lavish and, gatefold sleeve with uh, amazing artwork, the artwork and the smell of it all and yeah. the experience of having that. And, and the kids these days, they don't have that. Yeah, now it's a fucking icon on a smartphone screen. Exactly. It's not yeah. really the same. It's not the same. And it and it's, so, as you touched on before, um, it's so easy. If it was easy to be manipulated with, with Paul McCartney with with the pictures that are now on in a digital format, and let's be honest, they've been able to manipulate those photographs anyway. Um, it's What do you know what's real? You could go on Twitter now and they could you, you could have a broadcast of... Uh, Donald Trump or whatever, and you don't even know it's really him anymore. You just wouldn't, exactly. you wouldn't know. Well, it's not Joe Biden. It's certainly not Joe Biden. <laughs> no, it's yeah. certainly not. You know, but that's another one. <laughs> the President of the United States. I mean, I know it's a puppet role. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't have any real power, no. but supposedly, <laughs> supposedly he's the most powerful man in the world, <laughs> and it's not fucking him. Oh, no, yeah. And they've got away with it. And if it is him, it's a guy that is, is clearly not capable. It's so, it's so it, it does It does make me wonder, because they could have put anyone in that role. Yeah, yeah. Why did they choose a geriatric bloody guy with dementia, a, a bad actor? Because they're just taking the piss. Yeah, it's almost as if they're, they're rubbing our noses in it. They are. It's either satanic mockery, because they think we're just so ignorant. Yeah, yeah. That they enjoy, they're having a right old laugh winding us up. Or... They're trying to wear you up. They're trying... Well, I don't, I don't even want to go down that route, because there's certain communities yeah who will claim that there are certain plans in place uh, yeah I, of course I, I, don't I, don't, wanna... I don't i don't i don't go down that, no, that no. route at all but but, but uh, you know it, it's also obvious now that yeah it does feel as if they're trying to get people to wake up sometimes <sighs> well come on guys <laughs> <laughs> well before we close i want to say thanks again mark it's been an absolute pleasure sure but what's what's the plans for Mark Devlin now. What's your what's your journey? What do you see coming now? And what what level of success is matters to you as an individual now, going forward? Well, if you'd asked me twenty years ago, my definition of success mm. for me 
would be to be prominent as a DJ for people to know my name. Yeah. To be on loads of flyers, to be on loads of lineups. Yeah. And to be earning a, a decent amount of money and to be yeah. traveling the world. Yeah. I've always loved traveling. Yeah. Uh, my value system's completely changed now. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, it's, it's, it's so funny how it's worked out because I used to want to be all over flyers and at festivals and stuff like that. And now I don't really care about that. I want to get my message out. Yeah. But with all the offers that are coming in, I'm finding myself top of the bill on flyers. Yeah, yeah. And it's not something I crave now. Yeah, yeah. But it's happening anyway. It's happening. And I'm getting offers to speak here, there, everywhere, all over the place. And uh, it's all just happening. Yeah. Outside of my You're flowing control. with that, aren't you? Yeah. But it's never about me. It's not about me anymore. Yeah. I used to have a bit of an ego as a DJ. I think you have to. Yeah, To course. succeed in that game. Yeah. You've got to carry yourself with a bit of swagger and be a yeah. bit big-headed. But <laughs> I'm not like that now. And it's not about me. It's about the message. I just want the truth out there. I want people to wake up to what's going on before yeah. it's too late. And I want freedom. I want freedom for everyone. Yeah. That's what's important to me. And what I do with my books and my live talks and my interviews is just try and attain that. Yeah. These are a means to an end. Yeah. I do all this work for those reasons. People yeah. might think, oh, I'm doing it because I've still got an ego and I like seeing my name up in lights. It's not that. No. It's not that. It's just that I've had certain training and I've got certain skills and certain experience, mm -hmm. which means that I can be very effective in reaching large numbers of people. Yeah. And I have. I mentioned in the talk that I did yesterday that I've been successful through talking about the manipulations of the music industry yeah. in drawing people into other truths. So if you can pique somebody's interest by talking about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or the Doors or David Bowie, yeah. you've got them. You've got their attention. I agree. They're listening to you. Yeah, yeah. And if you can make them see that that industry is completely controlled and is run by occultists and is part of a much larger control structure, yeah, yeah. then you've got them, got them on the first rung of the ladder. And then hopefully if you've engaged their curiosity, yeah. they're going to go away, do their own research and see how that fits into the much bigger picture of yeah. what's going on. And I've had a very successful track record of doing that through this work. It's been a great method yeah. of engaging people on the path to truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I intend to keep doing that for as long as I'm able. You're doing amazing work. I don't know work. what the future holds, but I'm just going to keep, keep on trucking, keeping keep the flow flowing through. Yeah. See, the TikTok generation would would I I, I think they would f engage in stuff like that. If, you know, I bet it's probably already happening. I don't really go on TikTok, but you know, I can imagine I can imagine like these short videos of expressing, like, say, Britney Spears, for example, yeah. as as a as a as an individual, sadly, who's clearly been mind controlled. Yeah. You know, the, the boom, quick, quick, quick. This is what's happened to Britney, and then that then plants a seed. Well, what's going on here? Yeah. You know, it's getting. That there kind are of thing some out. videos, some little snippets on TikTok, which mm. are really good. Mm. So uh, people are going on there yeah. and using that platform to share some of this truthful information. And it's going to be engaging yeah. large numbers of young people because so many young people go on TikTok. Definitely. I'm still on Facebook because that's my generation. <laughs> yeah. I don't do TikTok. But, you know, Gen Z, so-called, uh, my children's Gen generation. Oh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> they're, they're all about TikTok. Mm. So the more videos of this nature that get in on that platform, mm. the more young people are going to get to see them. That's right. And that is the generation we have to reach. The social engineers are after their minds of and their course, souls. The souls. So we have to be after them as well. Yeah, yeah. We're clamouring for that generation. We want to get them engaged in truth and that's freedom. Right. They want to take them down a very dark path. That's right. That's right. And that's that's the mission. Yeah. That is the mission. Mark, how do people find you then? How will how will people get all your your work? So my hub website is DJ markdevlin.com yeah. yeah and there's links there to all my podcasts all my videos my video platforms are odyssey bit shoot and rumble yeah you were taken off youtube i've been kicked off of three youtube channels <laughs> i have actually just started a fourth all right i'm cool. posting snippets on there just because so many people are on youtube yeah yeah and if yeah. i can pull them over from youtube 
to BitChute Odyssey Rumble. Yes. That's the idea. I understand that, yeah. So uh, my books are available on Amazon, but yeah. if you don't want to go down the Amazon route, you can get them from me direct. Brilliant. You just got to drop me an email. You'll find my email on my website, djmarkdevlin.com. Fantastic. Uh, I've also got an events page on there, which yeah. details all my upcoming talks. I do loads of conferences, festivals. Yes. Uh, I'm actually due to go to Las Vegas in October. Wow. And I'm doing a mini speaking tour of Australia in early November. That's amazing. I probably shouldn't even mention this new stupid bloody variant that I'm talking about <laughs> and the idea of lockdowns in mm -hmm. America coming back because I don't want to jinx the trip. No. So I'm going to have to keep a close eye on how things develop. Yeah. Uh, but at the moment, you're heading that those way. trips are still in place. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the very best, Mark, and keep doing the Cheers, amazing son. work that you're doing. Um, I highly recommend Mark's work. If you, especially like me, if you're a music fan, it may change your life. It did. It has for me. Um, it's always better to know, though. But right? it's better to know, and and it's an, an amazing, fascinating subject. And like Mark said, you can bring that up with anybody in your family, then, and then take them on a new path and, and really yeah. plant those seeds to yeah. what's really happening. So, I mean, who, who, when you say Paul McCartney's being replaced, and they hear that for the first time, yeah. who is going to go? Oh, I'm not going to look into that. No. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. The only response that's ever going to bring is. Oh, that sounds ridiculous. I must look further into it. Yeah, exactly. Right? Don't be stupid. <laughs> you, you are going to get people looking if you can plant that seed. Absolutely. And that's a good way to start. Yeah. It's a really good way to start. Subscribe to the Dread Miskin channel. We really appreciate your support. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you, Mark Devlin. It's been an absolute honour to have you here and an honour to have you at the festival, Mark. Thank you so much. No worries, mate. Thank you, brother. Thank, thank, you. thank you. All the best. Thank you.